Welcome to Restore the Glory podcast. My name is Jake Kim. And I'm Bob Schutz. We're two Catholic therapists sharing what we've learned personally and professionally to help you on the journey of restoration. If you've been blessed by our podcast, please prayerfully consider partnering with us on Patreon. Your support will help cover the cost to produce the podcast, but will also give you access to exclusive content like monthly reflections and special live stream teachings. Go to patreon.com slash restore the glory and join the mission of experiencing the restoration of our God-given glory. Well, hey, Bob, good to be with you again. I'm glad we're back here. We're in our second part of this series with regard to healing in marriage, and it's going really well so far. And for those of our listeners who are just kind of stepping in, um, this is kind of like a we've broken it up into two series like unity and marriage and then healing and marriage. And we're in the second episode of this healing and marriage, but all this stuff, if you're wanting to kind of really sit with it, you can go and get Bob's book, be devoted. And you can find that any places that you find books. And so we're breaking basically, I don't know, Bob, maybe we're kind of doing a book study of be devoted, but we're just piggybacking off of ideas that you laid out in that book and, and breaking them open more. So again, listeners, we encourage you to go check that out if you want to dive in deeper and hear more about it. But today we're talking about healing and forgiveness within marriage. Bob, you have a quote here just to dive right in that I thought was a really good place to start. Uh, and it says, our wounded hearts and character weaknesses make it extremely difficult to relate to each other lovingly, especially during intense conflict. You know, and when I read that, I thought, man, is that ever true? And again, our whole tagline, personally and professionally, I know that as a married man, but I also know that in my work with people. How about you? Yeah, it's hard. And we kind of run into those things everywhere. And marriage is the the place where they, they become most visible. I, I think one of the beauties and dangers of marriage is we see our character weaknesses probably more than anywhere else and the character weaknesses of our spouse and we're constantly hitting up against each other's woundedness. Even if we're not aware of woundedness, we're still constantly hitting up against it. Mm-hmm. And those two things, more than anything else, can destroy a marriage or make a marriage really vital, you know, depending on how we respond to them. It's so true. You know, I think talk about preconceived notions or, or assumptions and expectations that you bring in. I think everybody probably has that stuff that they're bringing into a marriage, assumptions and expectations about what their marriage will be or what married life will be. I know I did and Heather did, and I'm sure you did. And I mean, I'm sure all of that, Margie did, all that stuff is there. But if there's one thing I've ever encountered that's going to make you a saint, it's marriage. And maybe that's because I'm in the right, I'm in the right vocation, right? But if there's one thing that's also going to trigger the heck out of you, it's marriage. <laughs> and it, it sure does. It, like, I just loved the simplicity of the quote, and it brings all of that out. Two thoughts come to mind, and we can maybe break these open a little bit. I recall saying to, I was actually working with a religious sister. She was having a really hard time with the demands of the religious life that she had entered. It was a, a, a fairly intense uh, cloister, et cetera. And psychologically, it was very, very difficult for her. And I remember just pausing and saying out loud to myself and to her that religious life is for adults, not kids. Mm. And then I thought to myself, and man, the same is true for marriage. It's meant for adult males and females instead of boys and girls. And I mean, I, I mean that in the sense of our emotional maturity, our character maturity, et cetera, it really ideally for a marriage to thrive and everything to go great requires a lot of maturity, you know, cause just all that stuff that pops up and comes up. And so if you have immaturity in marriage, it will get exposed. And that's a lot of times what's happening is flaws and stuff are getting exposed. The boy and the girl that hasn't yet matured is getting exposed. Yes. What do you think? Yeah. And we all have those, whether, whether we are mature in many different areas of our relationship, uh, the areas of immaturity, you know, and and our wounds and character weaknesses tie into that, uh, just play out. They're just inevitably going to come to the surface. Uh, just, Mm -hmm kind of like a ping pong ball is going to float to the surface 
uh, <laughs> if it's underwater, it's, it's going to come to the surface some point in marriage. And I, I really like for couples that I'm counseling premaritally mm -hmm. to get to this point before they get married. I, Man, you know, I don't like people getting married in their honeymoon stage uh, because, you know, it's like, oh, we're going to live heavy, heavily up. Happily ever after. <laughs> That's a good synonym. Heavenly <laughs> yeah. ever after, yeah. <laughs> it's because we have this, you know, we know we're built for heaven. And yeah. so we want this perfect love. And it's a good thing to want. But mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to get it from ourselves or from the person right across from us. And if we go in believing that we should and demanding that we should, we're going to be in trouble pretty soon after we get married because we're going to run into those character weaknesses and the woundedness. Yeah. And you, you know the thing that comes to my mind, I can almost hear our listeners saying, now maybe it's just me saying and I'm projecting <laughs> onto them. <laughs> but I think some people might go, then why would you even get married? Right? Because basically the picture that we're painting is not roses and flowers and ease and simplicity. But I think that's kind of the point is that, you know, why do sacraments exist? You know, it brings us back to the point of a lot of things and the real heart of a lot of things. They bring us, the point of sacraments is to make us holy and bring us back into union with God. It's just a real shift when it comes to marriage that the point of it is not for us to constantly be happy, but to transform our hearts so that we can truly be happy. Yeah. You know, uh, it's a transformation process, not just a make you feel good process. Yeah, and I think we've all been spoiled by Hollywood movies and oh, man. Uh, sitcoms. Well, all of the sitcoms can be yeah, pretty damaging. And, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and books and fairy tales. And, you know, again, they're, all of those have a dilemma in them, right? Mm -hmm. And you have yep. to get through the dilemma. And so that's true with marriage. It's not that there isn't happiness promised there. It's just yes. you got to be willing to face the dilemma. And so many people want to bail when we get to these places. You know, I married the wrong person. I remember going through that. I, I married the wrong person. Uh, and Margie, I'm sure, did the same thing. You know, I married the wrong person at a certain point. Right. And then you get through those places and you just say, well, this is my compliment. This is the person that God gave me to perfect each other. And she's really my best friend and, and the one that I – love the deepest, even though it's not been the easiest to love. Yeah. You know, Bob, it brings up a second point that maybe we can kind of, it's a little bit on topic, a little bit off topic, but it seems pertinent right now. And it's been something that I've been reflecting on recently. I feel like I'm in a process of redefining or rediscovering what healing actually is. And there's these categories that are coming up in that, in that process for me. And that's um, emotional distress. You know, when you're healed, Will all the emotional distress go away? Problems, you know, is healing about taking away all the problems? And, and some of the language I realize that's going on is that there's this symptom category, and then there's the problem, the root category, and then there's these breakthroughs or healing encounters, uh, healing experiences, but then there's also a maturation process. I mean, we've talked about in other episodes, security, maturity, purity, um, there's the healing journey. But I, honestly, Bob, if I'm honest, I think I'm bumping into places where I had expectations that healing was actually taking away all the symptoms. Basically, healing was symptom reduction or symptom removal. And I can say the right thing, and I usually say the right thing, but in my heart of hearts, I find myself struggling with the reality that healing is a is a process and a journey as well where i can be so focused on the emotions or the pain going away that i forget all the other things that are going on what's your experience like that ben yeah i think that's true i i think you know if you think about it if i go to the doctor and i'm struggling with a pain in a certain part of my body i want the pain to go away yeah and you know so there's an element of healing in that but if all we do is treat it topically and we don't deal with the disease that's there, then there's not. And, you know, we all have a disease which is called original sin yeah. and our own personal sin. And that disease has affected us and the people around us. And so it's really a whole life process. Healing is a whole life process. And Be Healed, I talk about healing is communion mm -hmm. and healing is 
growing in wholeness. And, yes. and to me, that's the security, maturity, purity is uh, as I grow in communion, I grow in security. As I grow in security and maturity, I grow in wholeness. And then that fruit of that is purity. And so the symptoms are there because, you know, part of purity is is the fruit of the spirit, peace and joy. But that doesn't mean without suffering. You know, huh. that, you know, Jesus is completely whole and completely in communion, but he still experiences suffering. Yeah. And so I think yeah. I think that's part of our cultural mindset uh, mm. that if I'm whole and in communion, I'm not going to have any suffering. Uh, right. And on this side of heaven, we're going to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of something that Heather says is that we all long for heaven, but we're not there yet. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think I really appreciate what she's saying because there's there's a tension that we have to find there, I think, in the healing journey, especially and, and in marriage and healing of marriage is that, yeah, the, the point isn't suffering, but that is a reality that we'll have to face this side of heaven. Now, the, the point isn't also that you just pile on the suffering or you don't try to address or alleviate the suffering. Because I think, you know, as always, we find we go into these extremes of right. there should be no suffering or, oh, well, the whole life is going to be terrible, right? Neither one of those are the right balance. Um, yeah, we pursue healing and it, and it does take time. But I was just it was just this weekend in Canada. We're still not going to mass. We're not, at least in British Columbia, we can't go to public gatherings or anything yet. Mm -hmm. And so we watch, I was watching mass and we like to watch Father Rob Galea and his homily this past Sunday was about healing. He actually said, and I just, it really struck me. And he said, for him, the goal of all healing is to return to a place of trust and surrender. Yeah. And I just went, wow, that is, you know, that's so not what you'd think, yeah. you know, that, you know, most people go, well, the goal of healing is that everything, all my problems go away and mm -hmm. I don't ever have any issues ever again, you know, but I really liked how he, that spin that he put on it. It's, it's returning back to a place of trust and surrender yep. Yep. with God. Yeah. And you know, that's where we're going in the next chapter in, in marriage, restoring trust in the next talk, but mm. it's the healing that allows that trust to be restored. Yes. Uh, and and that's what he was saying in that talk. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. So if if we kind of I guess pull back to the specifics of what we're talking about today with healing and forgiveness, I guess I feel like it's just a word of encouragement and perspective for our listeners and all married couples and people considering getting married is that marriage isn't going to be constant bliss and that's okay and normal. And marriage is if you stay in it and that's within reason you know there's times where you know things aren't you know there's a lot of discernment i guess is involved and a lot of people just like to have it be black and white but marriage is intended and it's perfectly designed to make you holy and really what comes to the surface is what's my goal in life is my goal in life to be happy or to be holy and i'd say the pursuit of holiness happiness comes along um, it's when you pursue happiness that holiness doesn't necessarily come along with it. Yeah. You move on in the chapter here and you talk about some destructive attitudes and behaviors that comes from that marriage expert, John Gottman. Um, I think we mentioned him in the last episode. Yeah. Yeah. And I just like the simplicity of the four categories. Do you want to list those and break them open a little bit? Well, I don't have them in front of me, but from what I can remember, contempt was the first one, right? Yeah. And criticism. Yep. Defensiveness and then withdrawal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you so, know them just so, fine. <laughs> yeah. It helps to reflect on them for a long time when you're writing and uh, also in your heart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think I was using the example of Margie and I uh, in the book. Just those are painful things to recognize in yourself, but they're so valuable to see them and be aware of them because these are what he says destroy intimacy in marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all, to one degree or another, practice each of those four things at different times. The, the problem becomes when we these become habitual in our relationship, and that's what destroys a relationship. And so mm -hmm. it's those areas are the, if you will, the symptoms of a lack of trust and a lack of healing mm -hmm. and a lack of character. You know, those are really four areas where our character weaknesses play out. Yeah, And so contempt is kind of projecting our shame out to the other person. Hmm. 
You know, it's you see it in Adam and Eve in the garden. You know, it's like this woman you gave me. Uh, yeah. it's, it's it's blaming. It's it's looking out at the other person and losing their dignity, losing their sense of value in in your eyes. And mm -hmm. it it happens so easily in marriage where we begin to slip from having these rose-colored glasses for the other person, and then we begin to see their weaknesses, and then we begin to to perceive them according to their weaknesses, and then we begin to close our heart off to them in that place. And that's just such a painful place in marriage when that contempt starts to build up, and oftentimes there's bitterness and resentments that are a part of that. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the thing that struck me about those those four things was I felt like Gottman was putting his finger on what the result of vows are huh. and if and if people you know if you want to go back and and what i'm talking about is the anatomy of a wound where you have a wound beliefs and vows you know why is somebody so critical it's because they've been wounded and they've made a vow maybe to protect themselves and what comes out of that is say criticism or they've been wounded and they made a vow i'll never be hurt again so then they have withdrawal or defensiveness and i thought these are what you see it's the fruit the the quote unquote bad fruit that comes out of all the dilemmas and wounds that we've experienced in our hearts. Yeah, beliefs, judgments, vows, all, all those things. Yeah. Turn into these in in marriage. Yeah. Yeah. And that's I mean, that's why we're zooming in and highlighting and, and saying, if this stuff's going on in your marriage, I think it's so common, right? Marriage therapy where where people go well, they don't ever do this, or he doesn't ever do that, or she doesn't ever do yeah. that. And so often, I know for you and I, we we hear that, and that matters. But at the exact same time, we are looking down below the surface and going, why is this such a big deal for this person? Yep. And there's almost always a story involved about why this is so intense for the individual. Because you know what's funny, and this is where it usually backfires, is that same spouse will go talk to their friend whether it be the same gender or the or the opposite gender, and then that person isn't bothered by it at all, and then they have a conversation and they go, I don't know what the big deal is. Why is he so bothered by this? It's not a big deal. Well, it's because that friend didn't have the same wound. Yep. And so they're not triggered by it. But you talk about something else, guaranteed that that person will start being triggered. And then you start to go, man, God, you put us together so perfectly that we trigger the heck out of each other. Like we're like perfectly aligned to trigger each other. And either God's chuckling and going, ha ha, I gotcha. And that's not true. But sometimes we perceive it. Or he's saying, exactly. Yeah. Because this is the perfect environment for you to mature, to heal. Yeah, I, I think I have may have shared this in another episode, but I'd share it in this chapter where uh, it, it was over the issue of Budweiser for Margie and I. And yeah. her dad's nickname was Bud because he loved Budweiser. Right. And he was distant most of the time, but when he would come home after work, grab a Budweiser and sit down under the tree, she could come and sit next to him and feel close to her dad, and he would open up and feel be a father to her. And so when she got older, she started drinking Budweiser. And I don't know if she conscious of that connection, but later on we became conscious of it. Yeah. For me, drinking, seeing it in my brother's addiction and my dad's addiction, drinking meant abandonment. Mm. Drinking meant loss. And so unconscious early in our marriage, whenever Margie would open a Budweiser, this contempt would come into my heart towards her, then whether it was direct or subtle, then the criticism, and then I'd begin to withdraw. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And then uh, just pull away. And, you know, that would hurt her. And we would get into this cycle of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, not realizing that each of our two wounds were just being played out constantly there. And then the character weaknesses that were tied into the contempt and the criticism and, and those kind of things. Yeah. I mean, it's um, that phrase that Sister Miriam says, and, you know, it, I think it comes out of various, you know, um, the anonymous groups, uh, whatever one is that if you don't transform your pain, you'll transmit it. Yeah. Um, and man, is that ever true? Because that's exactly what we're talking about is we all have childhood wounds. 
we all have been affected by something to varying degrees. You know, some people go, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I had a great childhood. Awesome. That's great. It doesn't mean that you uh, never had any negative experiences that are impacting you. You know, often I found with people who say, oh, my, my family was great. My family, everything was perfect. They actually have a, probably a taste or a bit of an avoidance dynamic going on. Now, I'm not trying to find wounds every under rock or under, yeah, if that makes <laughs> sense. But yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Is that it's the goal is not to go, no, you're just as wounded as me. Yeah. Um, but usually the people who are don't have many wounds are quite quick to find the things that have that that are there because they're just humble and free, right? They're not bothered by the reality of 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 a, another wound or something to address being there. Um, but anyway, what we're trying to get at here is that childhood wounds significantly impact your marriage. Let me just say this that simple truth again. <laughs> your childhood wounds. Everybody listening, Jake, Bob, we know this that. Your childhood wounds, the things that happen to you significantly impact your marriage, your adult relationships. And not just childhood wounds, but it's the wounds that happened in Thank your you. dating relationships. And if you've had any serious uh, brokenness in relationships before, all that gets brought into the marriage. It does. Oh, I mean, Bob, it is my story with this is so clear. Honestly, I just go, It's. I don't even know how to say it. I think I'm just... I want to sigh and go, oh, it, it's so obvious, but at the exact same time for me, it's frustrating that it's so obvious, right? I get tired of this reality because I have wounds and character flaws that aren't better yet, and they pop up all the time. And there is a space and a zone of the healing journey that I'm in is coming to realize that I'm lovable and, and imperfect. Um, that I can be secure and imperfect, that the Father can love me and bestow identity even though I don't have everything together and suffering occurs. And so just I think there's a sigh that comes out of me <laughs> because it's just so true. I yeah, just, yeah. Uh, okay. And what I guess, what I do with that sigh makes a big difference. Like I can revolt against it and then my intensity level goes up and then everybody around me is like, whoa, watch out. Jake just entered the room. Yeah. Or another extreme is just, I can become depressed and uh, nothing's going to be good. You know, it's just so true. Yeah. And, you know, as you said, learning to be loved in that place is the key to learning to love our spouses in that place. You know, if, if we can't receive God's love in that place of our weakness, both character weakness and woundedness, mm -hmm. then we can't extend that love to our spouse. And then we also inevitably don't believe our spouse can love us there either. Yeah. And so we're just constantly in this, uh, I'm not going to love you in your weakness and you're not going to love me in my weakness. And, you know, we're just going to battle it out there. Wow. That is a nail on the head. Like I, I know that very personally. I was just talking to it the other, uh, just talking about the other day with a mentor of mine in my psychology work, and and we were talking about the the role of acceptance, and he was saying, if Jake, if you can't accept yourself, you're going to find it very hard to accept the people that you work with, and I and I internally for a second I went, I, I accept people pretty easily, I think pretty well, and what was what the reality was is that that process of accepting them is hard for me. It's not that I don't do it. It's just that it's very uh, taxing hmm. because I struggle to accept my own dynamics. And one of the things that he said that's very important for acceptance to happen is that you know you're cared for beyond yourself. Hmm. And he went, because what he was talking about was security. Yep, yep. For you to accept what your story is, your wounds are, et cetera, you have to know you're cared for beyond yourself. Yes. And I went, man, there's that's the father. Yep. Knowing I'm loved beyond myself. And that's exactly what you were just saying. Yeah, I just recently, Sister Miriam and I were giving a conference together mm -hmm. and uh, she talked about, she was quoting Father Jacques Philippe saying, fatherhood is the reality that I can have weaknesses and still be loved. And in our world, we're canceled anytime we can't be. And and so we live in a cancel culture because there's no room for weaknesses and failures. Right. 
And, and man, gosh, we could go down that path. Maybe we'll have to do that in another episode because yeah. that is such a powerful dynamic. And the social media world is basically uh, an avenue to present ourselves maybe not totally as honestly as we are. And then the, the social media world spins and says, I'm going to like this whole thing of no filter. Yeah. Right. Just that alone is an amazing thing to think about. Like, oh, look at me. I put a picture up and I didn't put a filter on it. Yeah. And I thought, if you just pause for a second and apply that to life, oh, look at me. I went through a day and I didn't fake it. Yeah. Like that's novel, right? Yeah. That just anyway. So, okay. The, I think the next place that really we wanted to spend a little bit more time is with regard to healing and forgiveness, right? That the, that's where we're at today in this episode. Bob, you have a quote, and I think it just laid out really nicely these um, some categories that we can break open for people um, about what does healing look like in marriage. And so, uh, again, this is from Be Devoted. You said, to be fully effective, it must also deal with trauma and all self-protective strategies that have formed around our hearts. And I, I'm in that section, you're talking about forgiveness for it, right. for, and that's what the, it's referring to. So in other words, for forgiveness to be fully effective, we must deal with the trauma and all the self-protective strategies that have formed around our hearts. This involves, one, renouncing our fearful judgments, two, releasing our pain and anger, and three, letting go of unhealthy attachments that keep us for, and others from being free. So renouncing fearful judgments, releasing our pain and anger, letting go of unhealthy attachments. Bob, I thought it would be valuable for us to linger there with those three and maybe break those open a little bit so our listeners can kind of get some traction with those about, well, how do, how do I do that? So let's start with renouncing our fearful judgments. What comes to mind about practically what people can do? Yeah, let, let's just take a practical example. Let's say that, that there's been some betrayal in the marriage, mm -hmm. whether it's somebody lying to somebody else or somebody uh, developing uh, a compulsion to pornography or being unfaithful or something like that, you know, something mm -hmm. fairly significant that's broken uh, trust. Right. Probably it's going to tap into other places in life where trust has been broken, where there's been betrayal. But whether there is or not, there's very likely to be some fearful judgments being made. And the difference between a fearful judgment and a judgment made in the Holy Spirit is we're able to stay in love when we make a discernment in the Holy Spirit. This is right. This is wrong. I'm still able to love you in those places. But fearful judgment is I've now become afraid of you, and so my judgment becomes a self-protection. Mm. right? And and so I'm, and I probably have a deeper root of that fearful judgment that, that just now brought into our marriage. Uh, that you can't trust anybody and you know they're going to let you down and you know the the vows and all those things that happen mm -hmm. and so forgiveness needs to deal with that judgment because if i forgive you you know if i'm if i'm forgiving my spouse margie uh, over the years but i'm mm -hmm. still holding on my fearful judgment towards her mm -hmm. then there's not really a release of my heart mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. it's it's they're words that don't penetrate the places where the barriers are up in my heart towards her. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it yeah. needs to go down to those levels that forgiveness needs to reach that. Yeah. I mean, you're talk when you talk about that, what comes to mind is all the times I've gone to mass and I've just said the creed out loud. Yeah. Versus actually a belief in it. Right. And so I can so I think what you're talking about here is the power of belief. Yes. Right. And that's really what the these uh you know, if you go back to anatomy of the wound, we're talking about identity lies as one form, and then judgments is another uh, type of belief. But judgments are a are a lie based belief. Fearful judgments are a lie based belief about another person. And I know that so powerfully in my life. Like when you said that, just right there, I thought my story is full of experiences where I didn't. I I longed for attachment with women. I didn't feel safe. Felt rejected. And then my judgment became around almost all women, which is uh, pretty difficult to be married if you have judgment around all women, right? It can affect yeah. you as a father, et cetera. And what, it, I mean, you put the words to it perfectly is that I'm afraid that of what they'll do or how they'll, and so they're bad, they're unsafe, they're not gonna actually care for me. They've got something else going on that they're not talking about, right? Those are all examples of things that were going on in my heart. But, you know, if I looked at my story, Bob, all those seemed so accurate and true. Yeah. Like I, I could go, here's all the evidence. Yeah, here's about all the evidence. Why. Right. And I'd list it off and I'd go, yeah. of course, 
you, like Heather is the primary one who had to suffer from my fearful judgments. It made so much sense in my mind. And that's the value of being able to see the woundedness is that it was my woundedness yeah. that was actually leading to that conclusion. And you know what ended up happening, and Heather and I still continue to work through this, is that the result is that I wasn't actually even seeing Heather as right. she actually is. Right. I was looking at this projection of all my fearful judgments and I was like, I don't want to trust that person, but it wasn't actually even Heather. I was like throwing stuff onto her that wasn't actually her. Yeah. And she could feel that. And that was really painful for her. So again, childhood wounds, woundedness outside of, you know, teenagers, whatever. When we've been wounded, we then go into self-protection and that's what leads to judgments of other people. And then you end up not actually seeing the person sitting in front of you. You just see your woundedness. Yeah. And, and knowing your story and how early that wounding happened with your, yeah. your mom's not being able to be there with you, you're not being able to have that security. You yeah. know, I have a lot of compassion for how those judgments develop and why you needed those. And yet with yourself, you can be hard on yourself when those judgments come up. And, and over your part of the healing in your life has been being able to see that little boy and being compassionate for you and, min and allowing him to receive what he needed, which is an ongoing process, so that you can then release the self-protection. So it's, it's a deeper thing than just saying, oh, I forgive you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so I, I think that's a valuable process, what you just laid out. I mean, there are some real practicals. Bringing in love, acceptance, safety into the wounds, and that could be many, it could be one. Um, one of the things I say for people is a little footnote is that it doesn't have to be a dynamite experience of a wound that just blew every, your whole heart to pieces. It could, it could be a little trickle effect. And it just one, these little things happened thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And that can also have a wounding effect. So it doesn't have to just be one giant event that blew everything to pieces. But what you're describing there is that in the judgment or in the beliefs is that I first have to have something come in to bring the wound some peace before I can then go and renounce some of those judgments because it won't work if I still feel terrified that I'm going to, let's say, be abandoned. And then I go and try to renounce judgments. Yeah, they might release a little bit, but they're just going to come right back because that young part of me doesn't feel safe. Yeah, And he's just going to go, nope, I'm not safe. Let's just turn right back around and sign sign up on that dotted line again. Yeah, yeah. Which, which brings us to the second point there in it, which is the releasing the pain and the trauma that's there. You know, it's yeah. like those judgments are protecting against pain and trauma. Yeah. Well, let's dive into that. Go ahead. Let's take the example with me with Margie uh, okay. and my fearful judgments around her opening a beer. I was projecting all kind of pain into that opening of the beer. And the reality is she wanted to get closer because that was her experience. She wanted to get closer when she opened a beer. Hmm. But immediately my judgments are she's abandoning me. Hmm. It, we're totally not rational mm -hmm. uh, because she wasn't. Right. But inside of me that was the fear that came and so the judgment was there to protect and it wasn't until i went back and felt the pain of the abandonment from my dad due to his mm -hmm. drinking and the pain of my brother leaving because of his drug addiction and his drinking that was i had to walk into that and release the pain of that and release the judgments that i held towards them mm -hmm. before i could see margie differently and, and again it was an ongoing process it wasn't like this one and done, but there were some big breakthrough moments hmm. uh, where I deeply grieved the the pain of loss mm -hmm. and was able to forgive in a whole different freedom after that than I was before that. Before that, I was still trying to forgive. I was choosing forgiveness with my will, but my heart wasn't releasing uh, the judgments and the and the the contempt that was a part of that. Yeah, I, I like when you say the word release because to release something, there has to be a measure of safety. You know, I think of like yep. a clenched fist. Yeah. Um, to release that, you have to not be in protective mode. Right. Um, and then what does releasing actually mean? I mean, you said it, I grieved. Um, I, you know, another way you could say it, I don't mean to make the rhyme, maybe there's something to this, but you also received. Yes. Is you have to receive the 
the thing that you didn't get in those moments, you know, it goes back to our type A, type B traumas. Um, those things have to be addressed before you can actually release anything because the releasing happens when there's safety and things are generally okay. And that's why, you know, for our listeners, that's why Jesus coming into a memory is so powerful and important and essential is because he's the one who can do all of these things. He is he can provide the very thing that we needed, whatever the moment is. And he or or his representatives, you know, Paul uses the language of an ambassador for Christ. Right. And so there's sometimes when Mary will come into a memory and that's the right thing. It's, Jesus doesn't get bothered by that, right? He's secure. Yeah. He's yeah. he's not frustrated. And sometimes it's a friend in the name of Jesus who's there. There we go. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And so there's where healing starts to take on the whole body of Christ, the whole family of God becomes healing agents and all that. It's one that when we're safe, then we can start to grieve. And and another releasing I've seen that happens for a lot of people is that they start to feel safe enough. And then the emotions come out like they've never been able to come out before. Yeah. And that's when you have people sobbing for sometimes hours and hours because they never sobbed. They never felt the the feelings, that the normal feelings that they for so many years. Yeah. I've even had some people say, Jake, I can't go there because I don't think I'll stop crying. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard many people say that. And they always do, and they're always happy they went there. But <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's true. It's yeah. a fear. And you know, yeah. sometimes it comes out first as rage or as, as anger yeah. or as yeah. frustration. It comes out in different ways. Yeah. And I think the big category of what we're talking about here is releasing our pain and anger. Yeah. The generic thing there is releasing the pent-up emotion that happens once you have a measure of security. Yeah. It's not like perfectly secure. Once there's the measure of I'm okay, then that's when emotion comes out. Because usually as a child, the emotion that would come out normally, your parents would shut it up or stop it. Yeah. And that was also part of the wound, right? Yeah. Don't feel, be quiet. Oh my gosh, you're overwhelming, whatever. Yeah, and, we, and that can happen in marriage. You know, it can happen, these processes can happen in marriage. You know, we're having this argument about this issue and we begin to recognize we've made fearful judgments and we start to try to look at ourselves and our spouse with compassion rather than with judgment and all of a sudden begin to be vulnerable and share the pain that's underneath that rather than the judgment. And then in sharing the pain, if the person, if our spouse is able to be with us, and I can think of several moments with Margie where she's just so tender in that place with my heart, mm -hmm. and then I can begin to grieve. Uh, mm -hmm. And in that grieving and in her compassion and vice versa, there's such an intimacy that develops there. There's such a trust that develops there. That is so true, Bob, because that I, we've both have experienced that in our marriage as well as in our professional lives where when this goes well in a marriage, yeah, man, that's powerful stuff for the, for the spouses, they, how they come together when they can be part of the healing journey. Yeah. Ooh, it is really beautiful. And and but what what's required there is um the, the counseling term there is differentiation. It requires a, a measure of realizing and seeing that I love my spouse, but as they're getting all emotional and, and intense with this stuff that's going on in their in their childhood or previous before I knew them kind of thing, it's not about me. Right. And what what you're what you're basically saying is that their experience is different than me. I'm different than this. That isn't me. So I can be present in it because the the crosshairs, the gun's not pointed at me. All this emotional intensity is not my fault. That's a big one for me that takes me out as if I feel it's my fault. I get all yeah. defensive and taken out. Yeah. But when I realize it's not, man, I can be right there with her, right there with Heather. And and part of that is when when our spouses don't project onto us but own the pain, it's a lot easier to do that. It's a lot harder when we're projecting to each other to not get defensive there and begin to to self protect. So, uh, I think that growth is maturity. You know, just both on the mm -hmm. on the part of the person sharing the pain, to be able to share it in a way that's not projecting judgment and blame, but also the the one who's uh, responding, as you were describing, can can have some level of differentiation of maturity. To be able to say, okay, even if the blame's coming, it's coming out of a place of pain. Let me just sit here and not get reactive and not take it into myself and not go to shame. Let me just, Jesus, you're here with me. Let me help me to love them in this place. Yeah. 
it's such a powerful thing when you can do that. And and to me, that's a lot of what therapy is, is the therapist, hopefully, you know, through their own anointing of God, but also through training that they have the capacity to let the person do all the emotional things and healing things that are needed and for them not to take it personally. And then they become a very mature, safe place for the person to process through their intensity. Yeah. It's a lot easier yeah. as a therapist than as a spouse, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say. It's uh, a whole different thing. Even when yeah. we have the skills and we have the knowledge and we know what's needed, it's those places inside of us that react. Yeah. Yeah. I think for ther our therapist listeners out there, there's like a double portion of shame. Yeah. And I, I don't say this jokingly, that happens when we have our struggles because we can so quickly say to us, and the enemy loves to use this one, you should know better. Yeah. I mean, you're a therapist. Yeah. Look at you. Look how poorly you handled this or whatever. Oh, it can be powerful. I remember yeah. one time uh, being aware of a judgment towards Margie, and it was, I was we were watching a movie, and uh, the movie just brought up this place inside of my heart, and I just said to her, I'm a fraud. You know, here I go and teach this all over the place, and mm. with you, I can't live the way I want to love you well. And that was one of the moments where she just really loved me well because she could feel my vulnerability there rather than blaming her. You know, you bring up an important point there about vulnerability. If vulnerability is a great indicator that safety is present. Yeah. If a person could be vulnerable, that usually means that they feel safe. And so my encouragement on just a practical level for spouses is if you sense that your spouse is being vulnerable, be very, very careful. Yeah. Be slow to anger. Be very slow to any kind of intense response. Provide lots of space because vulnerability, that there's a tenderness there. It's really important. Yeah. And if you're not responding to it well, that's usually when the re-traumatizing occurs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very, very wise. We got a third point here, and I think we probably need to bring to close pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. Our third point is letting go of any unhealthy attachments um, that keep us and others from being free. What what comes to mind with that one, Bob? Well, I think about soul ties. I don't know if we've talked mm. too much about soul ties, but think so. uh, but unhealthy attachments. Uh, mm. And even in good relationships, we can have aspects of it that are unhealthy attachments around our judgments, around our unforgiveness, or around manipulation and control. Mm -hmm. uh, but also related to previous relationships you know the, the scripture talks about leaving and cleaving you know yeah. and so many of us get married without emotionally really leaving our relationship with our parents and so we're still bound up in some ways emotionally with our parents mm -hmm. and that then takes away from our intimacy and our cleaving to each other in marriage mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's an important thing it's not to break our relationship with our parents but break the unhealthy aspects the places where we're still in dependency in relation to our parents or they still have control in some way and and we're not able to establish a, a, a unity there right um, but the other side is is previous relationships or present relationships we could have friendships even mm -hmm. totally non-sexual relationships with men or women that are interfering with our marriage you know we're going mm -hmm. to them rather than our spouse or we can have previous relationships where we have not dealt with the attachments and and forgiven in those relationships and really work through the pain of those relationships and we unconsciously bring them into the marriage and so all of those are areas in which we need to to release the attachments renounce the attachments that are unhealthy and allow this to be the primary attachment uh yeah and and that can be with kids too i mean we can as as hmm. husband and wife we can look our, our spouse doesn't feel safe we can look to our kids to be our safe place mm -hmm. and develop a stronger attachment with our children than we have with our spouse which is not good for the kids and it's not good for our marriage man bob i think i mean soul ties is something that you know it's maybe a, a a different depth of understanding in the healing journey but boy is it something that's so powerful basically like you said the leaving and cleaving, like cleaving, the coming together is such a natural, powerful thing that God instituted and it's good. But when it happens in the wrong context, the bond was never supposed to be there. And so the bond, it's like the wires are connected, but they are not doing what they should do. 
And so for people to go like, what does that mean? How do I know that? You know, it's that thing where you're driving in the car and all of a sudden your mind always keeps daydreaming back to that particular relationship you had before your spouse. And the thought maybe is something like, oh man, I think it probably would have been way better if we got married, right? So that previous relationship or it's the, oh, I, I would rather spend time with so-and-so and, -so and I, I like them so much better than my spouse. And you find yourself like your heart, your emotions are drawn, are pulled into the other person and not into your spouse. There's an indication that there could be a soul tie. And yeah. the language is really descriptive. Yeah. Our souls are tied to the wrong person. Yeah. Or, or it could be we, we get into an argument, we go back to our parents or back to a, a friend or a brother and sister rather than address it with our spouse and begin to badmouth our spouse or go to our, one of our children and begin to, you know, kind of collaborate with our child in the judgment towards our spouse or the, you know, That's there are so all things that destroy intimacy yeah. and trust. Yeah. And basically that, that bond is interfering with the bond that is uh, supposed to happen. So the, you know, bond with a previous relationship, et cetera. And so what we're saying by breaking or cutting a soul tie is that bonds can be broken and there there is spiritual reality there's spiritual realities to them and so i would just refer people back to the in a previous episode what we've called our th the three r's so repent renounce receive mm -hmm. that's a great way to address a soul tie so repent for the unhealthy relationship and this is all you know in love and trust with god but then acknowledgement i shouldn't have done this and i turn away from it that's what repentance is then renounce it and that's with your will saying, no, I don't want this anymore. I break this soul tie and doing that in the name of Jesus. And then it's a receiving of Lord, please fill the spaces and places in my heart that were left empty or that I'm trying to go to this person for. So three R's, repent, renounce, receive. You know, you might have to do that with 20 people. You know, you might yeah. have to do that with two. I don't know, but those things matter. They're, they're real. They're happening. Yeah. And you may not know this, but I'm, I quoted you on those three in my upcoming book. Uh, which oh, cool. by the time this episode is heard may be out pretty soon. Uh, and and also have a prayer for renouncing soul ties and renouncing in there. Yeah, I'm I'm still getting through the, the pre-read of it. <laughs> <laughs> I got an advanced copy. <laughs> <laughs> to to kind of wrap it up here, what we're what we're hoping, listeners, that you'll be able to see is is the importance of renouncing fearful judgments, releasing our pain and anger and letting go of unhealthy attachments. We hope that you've gotten some, you know, some practicals about how to do that. And again, to kind of set this back in context, it isn't a one and done, Bob, I liked how you said that. It, this is a journey, it's a process. There, um, there's times where you're gonna address something and then a week later, you're gonna circle right back around to that spot, but it's a little bit different. You're cutting out, you're getting rid of a little, something a little bit different. So don't be discouraged if you find yourself continually addressing the same thing because you're making a it's process instead of just instantaneous uh, things. Bob, any final comments? No, just to recognize this is hard to listen to probably if you're struggling in marriage. Uh, and just for both of us, we want, we want married couples to thrive and to have hope. We're not saying any of this to discourage. We're saying all this mm -hmm. to encourage and to hang in there because we all go through this, whether whether you think you have a perfect marriage or a terrible marriage, this is common to our human nature. And uh, we, we all need to walk here at some level with each other. And there is hope. There is a tremendous amount of hope if we can learn how to walk it well and, and grow in holiness, as you were saying earlier, grow in maturity, uh, and then learn to love each other purely and, and have the security that's there in the relationship. Yeah. Well, thanks for being with us, listeners. Thanks for um, coming along on the journey with us. You know, and listeners, thanks for your courage. I think Bob and I kind of know this implicitly is our podcast isn't necessarily a constantly feel good podcast. <laughs> and it's just on us. We're trying to lay out the reality of how to journey and how to experience, you know, freedom and, and restoration of our God given glory. And so thanks for your courage. Thanks for staying with us. Um, Maybe there's this episode would bless somebody that you know. We encourage you to send them to places that you find podcasts, or you can send them to our website, which is RestoreTheGloryPodcast.com. We pray that you would continue to experience the abundance of God's love, mercy, and healing. 